Good morning and welcome to Teaching and Learning TV. Teaching and Learning TV is an initiative of the University of KwaZulu-Natal Teaching and Learning Office and we are currently in session at the ninth annual Teaching and Learning Conference. The theme of this year's conference is Reimagining Higher Education Policy and Impl Implementation. Can Policy Learn from Practice? Um, the purpose of these particular panels uh, that we are hosting outside of the main conference is to enable expanded and more public discussions and discourse on what is happening within the mainstream sessions. So today it is my pleasure to introduce you to this very august panel of um, scholars who are going to engage us and enable the conversations which we want to have. So I'd like to introduce you very briefly to them and then they're going to say a little bit more about themselves. So first up we have Professor Herbert Chimhundu from the Chinoy University of Technology and he's a linguist and a lexicographer and I'd like him to say a little bit more about himself, uh, Professor Chimhundu. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this panel. Um, as you have uh, indicated, I am uh, a linguist but uh, working originally in the branch of linguistics uh, that we call sociolinguistics, which is basically about language and society. And it is from that uh, interest originally in the early 80s that I became interested uh, to see uh, that certain needs in the um, community uh, in which I was working, which is the Shona language uh, speaking community, uh, were satisfied. And one of the, you know, uh, glaring uh, gaps uh, where was uh, reference works, specifically uh, dictionaries for mother tongue users. Mm -hmm. um, that is monolingual dictionaries. And um, if, uh, we, we, when we got organized and eventually managed to start a project and produce the first uh, Shona Shona dictionary. And from there, that is what has led me to interest in the tools that you use to make uh, dictionaries uh, quickly and comprehensively, mm -hmm. and uh, that leads you to to uh, uh, information technology, uh, specifically the the tools you need for corpus building and uh, building databases. And uh, after uh, you know, from there, you, you are you are you are on the web. And and uh, my 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 reflections on that and the experiences and um, futuristic. Uh, kind of uh, aspirations are uh, what I've come here to discuss and wow. I'll be saying a bit more about that on Wednesday in my in my paper presentation. Well we are delighted to have you and certainly um, your 35 years of experience and <laughs> uh, wisdom we are delighted to draw on that today so welcome Professor um, Chimhundu and we're looking forward to, to talking to you. And then we have next up Dr. Margie Matthews, who's from the University of KwaZulu-Natal. She's uh, from the medical school and she heads up the skills laboratory there, but she's also been involved in the development of Isizulu communication um, in the health sciences. Um, Dr. Matthews, welcome, and please tell us a little bit more about what it is you do. Thank you very much, and very nice to be here. Um, as you've mentioned, I have a background in clinical practice. I've been involved in general practice, rural health, public health. So these are areas of interest for me. In working in the School of Clinical Medicine and having a particular interest in communication and healthcare, we've obviously identified the need in a province where nearly 80% of people are Isizulu speaking to support Isizulu communication as well. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that, that is part of our work. This also talks to the need to responding to the needs of your community, which is part of what was discussed this morning. Yes. We actually need to be socially responsive, not only in terms of language, but in terms of other issues such as culture. Right. So that's basically my involvement. Great. So, and we look forward to learning from your experience in this particular area as well. And then, of course, we have Dr. Langa Kumalo, um, who heads up the unit is it? Uh, it's uh, the unit for language policy and development at um, the University Teaching and Learning Office at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Welcome Dr. Kumalo and can you tell us a little bit more about what it is you do? Thank you. Um, I am the Director of Language Planning and Development at the University of KwaZulu-Natal uh, responsible for 
operationalizing the language policy as it subsists at the, at the university. And one of the things that UKZN has done uh, is to initiate a program to intellectualize Isizulu so that it functions at par with Isizulu uh, in our dual language policy. Um, but if I may uh, go outside that a little bit and uh, give you some background about myself. Mm -hmm. uh, not, uh, I am also a linguist, and uh, I think that you'll be interested to know that I am a product of uh, Professor Herbert Chimundo. Oh, wonderful. I have been uh, <laughs> mentored early by him uh, in both uh, linguistics and corpus lexicography. Uh, so it is very, uh, uh, I think, daunting. <laughs> To sit with your mentor <laughs> in the same panel and talk a about privilege. issues, it is a privilege. Yes. It is a privilege. Uh, and I am very uh, happy to have him here. And maybe to encroach into Maggie's uh, also introduction, she also sits in the Universe Language Board, mm -hmm. uh, where we sit and uh, discuss the implementation of the policy at the university. So they are both colleagues that I have worked with and that I work with very closely in uh, language development. Wonderful. As you can tell, we have um, a really great panel of scholars to discuss this issue of language in, um, in higher education and um, the things that are related to that. As Professor Chimunda has already indicated, his keynote address is going to be on Wednesday. And so uh, we, should, we, we don't want to have too many spoiler alerts, but um, we do want to engage, I think, um, um, drawing from the keynote um, address this morning to continue some of the discussions there and hopefully Professor Chimhundu will also tell us, uh, um, give us some insight into the kinds of things that he will be talking about um, on Wednesday at the conference. But perhaps we can begin with the ideas that were presented at this morning's um, um, a keynote um, address and um, uh, Professor Adam Habib um, indicated that there are four particular fundamental issues, if you like, that we need to begin to address if we want to talk about differentiation in higher education. And, 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 and what I'm wanting us to do is perhaps have a conversation on how that relates to language development and policy. So the first thing he said, which I think had to do with more around the transformation issues and the fact that um, um, we have um, lots of turmoil in the South African higher education system at the moment, was the confusion between radical and violent. And I'm not sure if there's anything that if you want to say about that particular part, but there's three other issues that he, he brought up, and that is the issue of caring within the curriculum, and I think, um, uh, um, Margie, you were sort of hinting at that um, in your introduction, the issue of creativity in the production of knowledge, so how, how do we become creative um, within our production of knowledge. And finally, which I really like, um, is the issue of using locality as a source of innovation. And so I think I want to begin there. Um, and I think Professor Chimhundu, you might have a lot to say about this, given the, your experience with the language um, dictionaries and then with technology, is how do we use locality as a source of innovation? All right, the key, in my view, to using uh, locality uh, as a source of both knowledge production and innovation mm -hmm. is language. Right. Because language is so fundamental. Uh, it, 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 uh, it's, it cuts across everything, all fields, all sectors. It is the tool that gives you access. It is the tool that makes it possible once you have that access right, to understand Mm -hmm. uh, it is also the tool that you use to, to, to convey right. uh, what you find. So um, it, is, it is critical, I think, to have a, a language policy. And I'm glad you have one uh, at the university level because it's not every institution that actually has one, apart from prescribing a, a medium of instruction. This is mm -hmm. mostly what we get. Uh, it's important to have a language that is uh, proactive enough to accommodate uh, the main tool as in the form of language mm -hmm. of the of, of the predominant body or bodies of your, of your students right. uh, without necessarily prescribing um, any particular one as, as a language of instruction but you have to have that that access and uh, if we're talking of language of knowledge 
there is knowledge in the community itself. Yes. Knowledge you do, is not something that you, you just draw from books or from the web. Mm -hmm. uh, and very often we find that in our universities we ignore that aspect and uh, consider that, oh, well, our duty is to impart knowledge, right? Not to, no, no, not to get it even from, from, mm -hmm. from, from, from the locality. And immediately you do that, you, you, you shut out something. That's one aspect. The other aspect is actually the, uh, the, um, the, 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 the assumption uh, that we have sometimes, which is not always correct, that by the time students come to the university, uh, because they have satisfied a certain exam a requirement in a particular language, which is the medium of instruction at a certain level, they are ready for academic work, mm -hmm. discourse, yes. writing in that language. That again is incorrect. Um, so, well, without being over elaborate, I will just say this. Um, basically, language is not speaking. It is ideas. Mm -hmm. it, it is uh, those ideas and the, the, the coding of those ideas, the patterning of the form of expression that you use in speaking is just one of them. So everybody comes to that extent equipped. But in terms of preparation in the language that you're going to use, we are not all equally prepared by the time we get to the university. Mm -hmm. So what we need uh, again, following up on what the uh, Prof. Abib was saying, at that level is a radical but informed intervention as to what you have all around you. And uh, then you link it up. It's not just about the linguists, but it's mm -hmm. actually across the disciplines. Mm -hmm. yes. How you then apply um, and uh, develop appropriate uh, models and modules mm -hmm. of making language that you use for teaching relate better uh, to the language that the students are coming from and how they should bring their own language and its baggage into the setup, right. into the curriculum. Right. That should not be ignored. And, and I mean, the, 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 the issue of uh, language not just being about speaking um, relates directly to the point I think that um, the keynote was also addressing, that, and that is that this is a deeply political issue. That that actually when we talk about language um, in, in that way um, what we are talking about is how to be globally um, relevant while being locally responsible Absolutely. and I think that was one of the questions that came came up and perhaps um, Langa or Margi you would like to comment on this. Um, uh, yeah, I, I could and um, I think it's, it's, it's what Professor Shimondi and, and uh, Professor Habib in the morning uh, are talking to uh, in terms of um, innovation uh, and starting from uh, your locality in, in, with innovative uh, ideas and even packaging them and interpreting them with uh, ideas that we get from other communities is very critical. Um, knowledge, as he has rightly said, resides within our localities and it is our uh, duty to access that knowledge, interpret it uh, with methodologies that uh, are modern, uh, theories that uh, may come from other communities, but so that we can innovate in, uh, in our communities uh, and interpreting the, those innovations using other uh, foreign or local theories, that's, that's fine. But in order to access that knowledge, that knowledge is couched and stored in a particular language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it is that which we want to unlock. And if we ignore local languages which uh, store this knowledge, then we are actually missing out on uh, a very uh, important reservoir of, uh, of, of our knowledge systems. So language, therefore, becomes vitally important. And um, as he has rightly said, uh, la language policy is not about choosing and excluding one language mm -hmm. from the other. Mm -hmm. It is about accommodating the, the, the people that speak these languages so that they can function freely and uh, in an empowered fashion because language is such an empowering tool. If, if you go into a classroom and ask every person to introduce themselves in, a mother, in their mother mm -hmm. tongue, mm -hmm. that is so empowering. You know, mm -hmm. it's, you see everybody sitting back and uh, relaxing and saying a lot 
But if you want to take away their power, mm -hmm. ask them in, a, in an English class to introduce themselves in Mandarin. They yeah. will look at you and they will feel so disempowered mm -hmm. and they won't even start the conversation right. with you. Right. So language is a way of self-affirming, uh, reassuring, and uh, giving so much advantage to a person. Uh, and they get so comfortable, so deep in thought. And that is why sociolinguists have said uh, several times that it is difficult to innovate in a second language. You can only innovate in your mother tongue. So unless we can locate our, our languages firmly uh, in, in our education system, we are a second language because of these languages that are the medium of our, our knowledge creation. We are not going to be innovators. We are going to be consumers of this knowledge. And so in essence then, um, perhaps what this is about, uh, from what you were saying, um, Langa, it's actually about disruptive innovation. And disruptive innovation seems to be the, well, it is the buzzword at the University of KwaZulu-Natal at the moment, um, because our vice chancellor is using that as a phrase um, to, to guide change in the university. And so in, in a, in, to a large extent, it seems that with the language issue in particular, and particularly with um, marrying local um, uh, locality with innovation, what we need is disruptive innovation. Something needs to be disrupted first before something new can be created and innovated. Would you agree with that, um, Margie? And tell us a little bit about your experience with the Isi Zulu uh, innovations that you've had at the health sciences? Yes, I think it, it is important to realize that the status quo has to change. Mm -hmm. One can't go on doing things in exactly the same way. So if you look at, for example, the consultation and healthcare models, um, they've gone from biomedical to a more illness perspective. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you have to understand an illness perspective, you need to understand it in a local context. And the only way you can access those um, indigenous knowledge systems, for example, is through, is through the language. And we have a lot of problems in healthcare that are related to cultural issues. And we need to have a better understanding of those. And we need to be able to foster that in our, in our medical students. So there, there's a lot of emphasis at the moment in turning um, from a pure biomedical to a more patient-centered perspective. And if we centered on our patients, we have to understand the patients in the context that we're in and take it a step further to actually a community-centered approach. Um, so as, as Prof said a little bit earlier, it's not a top-down. It's looking at the community needs and responding to those community needs by curricular developments that will be appropriate. And the best way to do that is, is uh, incorporating language in this context. So, so it is also about curriculum development then, so it's not just about the policy, it's about how do you infuse this kind of thinking within the curriculum um, itself. Have you had a particular experience in this, um, Professor Chinhundren, um, will you be able to share some of that with us? Yes, I think we could say I do have some experience, but only in my area, Right. Uh, in one area, maybe more than one area. Um, as far as that area is concerned, uh, over the years, there have been shifts in interest, all occasion, but where, what you see is needs or new needs. And, and right now, where I see the links uh, uh, that are critical, as far as the language issue is concerned, putting it at the center now for this discussion, is that you have to link the language issue with uh, uh, technology, ICTs, specifically human language technologies, which make it possible for you to accelerate the process of, well, let's say developing those languages or, or raising their profiles to make them better equipped to operate in more domains. I'm, I'm fascinated by this. So say a little bit more about how um, technology um, is being used in the service. Um, I'm, I'm trying to understand it. I'm not a linguist myself, so. Well, it's, 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 it's more than just linguistics. Right. Uh, linguists can only go so far. Yes. Linguistics is a, a scientific study of, of language. You analyze, you study, you theorize about how language works. Right. And the traditional, uh, or the conventional, if you like, 
the Department of Linguistics. And I think in our part of the world in this region, we do tend to combine uh, linguistics and literature, sometimes with uh, communication, in, in a general sense, uh, communication skills, uh, general language and literature. Uh, it, we need to go beyond that so that uh, all that analysis, all that knowledge, uh, all that training we, we, we get even in writing, um, we, we need to go beyond that so that uh, the language itself as a tool is developed and equipped to operate, to work, to, for use uh, as fit for purpose in different uh, spheres. Uh, spheres. And when you have that, you are actually preparing effectively to implement the kind of language policy mm -hmm. Dr. Kumala was talking mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. It is not good enough just to prescribe by way of policy to say we shall have this language and that language in this university. And if we go the route that I am, I am proposing, obviously uh, you need to make sure that uh, everybody understands that they can contribute. It's not just about the... the, 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 the the is Zulu lecturer or linguist, uh, because you are not just going to teach <laughs> the, the, about the language, you are going to teach in all these other fields. Of you are course. going to teach in medicine, you are going to mm -hmm. teach in agriculture, and, and so on. And people in those fields have to, to understand that. Uh, there is, if you are talking indigenous knowledge or local mm -hmm. knowledge, or now you relate that to other, 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 other uh, sources, uh, you, you have to understand that uh, this knowledge comes through some medium. And it, typically what happens is, I, I'm, I'm, well, in a university you study everything, but if you are located here, in this place, in Tebet or in Arari or wherever, I find, you find that all the, 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 the researchers, all the lecturers go and do field work somewhere. In my university, Everybody, whatever their discipline, however technically uh, specialized it is, if they are going to do any work in any community, they, have, they use the local language. Yeah. Then they translate. Sometimes we are busy translating for people, consent forms, and all, all sorts of things, and then everything is translated back into English and published in all kinds of journals and so on. Then you go into the lecture room and, and teach. And nobody is doing anything <laughs> to accommodate that uh, population and bring it um, on board in the manner that we were talking about uh, earlier on. So I'm saying language is not just uh, for general conversation of the social use, that here we are talking about the academy. And even in your mother tongue, even if you are English speaking and we are using English here, when you get to the university, uh, you are now introduced to language for a certain purpose. It's academic writing, it's academic discourse, it's research, it's, and it's not quite the same thing. Now you can imagine for the person for whom uh, another language uh, is the home language or the community language or the mother tongue, the gap there. That is the gap that we, we, need, we need to address. So, if one passes an English language exam at matric or ordinary level, whatever, it doesn't really tell you anything about the facility that they have for when they get to the university. And you heard Professor Habib talking about master students who cannot write a memo. Yes. It's, it's, it's not that they don't speak English or they can't read and write English. And uh, we're literate and, uh, uh, and so on. But if you are empowered and equipped right, in your own language actually and, and you understand another, you are better equipped in, in the medium of the instruction even if it is your own. So it's not just about conversation, um, a language is conversation and language is a social tool. Mm -hmm. There's another level um, and that is the discursive level, so yes. language as discourse. And then the, the praxis. Um, in the university, so how does how does the technology then help this praxis? How does it um, help us to mediate from conversation to discourse? Mm. 
because that's the, it seems to me from what you're saying, yeah. that's what's needed um, in a higher education context, the, the, the use of technology. And, and that's what I'm still interested in, how is technology being used? Um, in, in, in language uh, raising, which he has insinuated, uh, and then in language intellectualization, um, it is, uh, technology would be at the center. And he has spoken about, on the one hand, having uh, a linguist, somebody who knows the language, the science behind the language and how language functions in society. And, and having other disciplinary experts, particularly uh, computer scientists, because then you are translating the language from what it is as a, as a, as a, uh, uh, a communicative tool, a tool that can uh, relate to the tech digital technology that uh, we have. What we have done at UKZN, if I can give a practical example, is to first dis, uh, develop uh, or build uh, an institutional corpus, mm -hmm. uh, which is which is which is which is growing. And in order for you to to build a corpus, uh, it is a collection of uh, spoken and written uh, texts in that particular language, stored, uh, processed, and stored uh, in a in a uh, a way that it can be used computationally. Uh, in, in processing and storing that corpus, you, you want to store it in such a way that it is machine readable, machine retrievable. And it is at that stage where, on the one hand, you have the, the linguists who have collected this language and uh, uh, annotated it, looked at uh, its appropriateness and stored it. And then you need a computer technologist, a computer engineer, who will then give you the tools to use and access and query that knowledge reservoir so that it can be used for other applications. What we, have, what we are doing right now, what we're in the middle of doing is to develop an institute spell checker based on the corpus that we mm -hmm. have de uh, developed. That spell checker, if you are going to ask anyone to write a memo or a, a, um, uh, an email in Isizul, say because UKZN we are writing everything is published in both English and Isizul. Even the communicator from HR director, it has to be both English and Isizul. If you want Isizul to, to function in, in, a, in a scientific uh, manner in which English is doing, you need those tools, you need the spell checker. And you can't get the spell checker without the corpus because uh, it has to be populated and checked against the corpus of uh, that particular language. So you need a computer engineer to develop a spell checker for you. I see. This is how, okay. technology, this is how <laughs> right. technology will come in. And then you can grow these applications because uh, what we have developed for, for medical sciences is for, to develop an, a, a, an app that is compatible with smartphones so that if they are uh, consulting with their, their patient in the field, they don't need a laptop or net, they will need a, cell phone. a dictionary. So you, so need you a, just have an app. An app that is that is compatible app. that will quickly translate uh, whatever it is that uh, the patient is saying. Say uh, they are saying uh, I have I have a stomach ache, but they are they're telling you in Isuzu. You need an app that will translate that very quickly for you. You know, it is right. it is moving away from what we knew, knew traditionally as glossaries because glossaries will give you one to one correspondence mm -hmm. to something that is more uh, contextualized, something that is more uh, that, that is in sentence forms and right. phrase forms, you know. So you, you need, again, a computer engineer to compute that for you so that you, your, your applications can be developed. So we are transcending from linguistics to other forms other of areas. specialities. And that's when we need that disruptive innovation that uh, 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 Prof. Uh, Von Yersfeld is talking about. Uh, traditionally humanists, and he will know better than me, Traditionally, humanists want to uh, work with their disciplines. If you are a linguist, you are a linguist, you do your, your linguistics. If you are a lexicographer, you do your lexicography uh, in your silos. If you are a historian, you do your history in, in your silos. But now we are trying to move these humanists into digital forms. Mm. And that's why, again, now in South Africa, we have what we call digital humanities. Yeah. Uh, we're trying to digitize humanities because uh, technology is in our face and we don't want to be left behind by technology. And so we have to learn how to use technology in our teaching. So we have to teach digitally. And that's what you are doing, uh, Margie, in the health sciences at the moment. Tell us about how that, that's working. And this is fascinating. This is really 
Interesting. I think um, our innovations are still at an early stage. Um, so you can't disrupt it yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, some of the initiatives that we've done are to try and um, create video media for students to access at any time. Students like using mobile technology, they like using computers, they're very um, techno savvy, if I can say that. So the types of things that Langa's talking about, the, the um, language apps, the translators and so on, I'll actually have students coming to me. I'm happy to say that we found a particular app that's helping us in a rural setting, for example, where we don't easily have translators. Um, and as I said, other than that, to support them, we have created a set of videos on common topics, again, where they can access them repetitively. Because language you can't learn in a, mm -hmm. in, in a short or sharp way. You need to be able to expose to it over a period of time, especially for adult learners. It is also a little bit of a challenge where they haven't been exposed to the language earlier on. But it's just a small group, and so they're supported with that. And then, um, if I can just simultaneously mention, there have also been initiatives to develop terminology. For example, in nursing, um, in anatomy, there have been concerted efforts to develop and improve and, and hone the terminology for those areas. And again, as, as Langa says, we don't want to work in silos. The new idea is that we should be collaborat co collaborative across professionals, um, sort of interprofessionally, so that's work with the humanities, work with the language people, work with the specific disciplines to see that the adaptations are appropriate so that the content is correct and the language is correct. We don't want either uh, level of quality to be, to be jeopardized. So those sorts of initiatives, I think, will all add in to, to um, our long-term term objectives, you know. In the short term, we have to assist students, and then there are the bigger goals of the, the academic levels and the intellectualization of the language as well. Mm -hmm. But it all takes time. But, and, and I think, um, you know, um, uh, my, my own sense is that technology can certainly assist in the, in, in the practical innovations that we need to, to, to make. Um, I'm wondering about in th that particular project, the intellectualization of the languages, and how that then functions um, with research and publication. How do we, in, in, in the context of higher education, uh, I was in Finland last week, and um, the dean who gave an address at the conference dinner spoke about a book that she's been reading. Um, and she's quite high up in the administration, and she said, I have a confession to make. I've been reading a children's book um, called Hello Ruby. And this book, she says, is written, um, I forget the name of the author, but it's written by someone um, who wants to teach young girls about computer programming and um, about what is involved in, in computer programming and the, the, the principles that are involved in computer programming. And what was interesting about uh, what she said was, there were three principles. She said, it's curiosity, so I want to know. It's creativity, how to bring you know, your imagination into it. And then something to me that didn't quite fit. She said, rules, it's about rules. And how you bring, and when you were talking about, um, you know, you need a computer engineer, they need to know how the language functions and how to do the different computations, etc. I thought, yes, I can understand that part, the part about the rules and, you know, uh, finding the equivalent in an app, etc. But the curiosity and creativity, surely those are the, 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 the crucial elements in, in the intellectualization of the languages, right? For, for use, for scientific use. Um, what's your sense about that? How helpful is technology there, um, Professor Chinot? Well, the, the term technology uh, is a very general term. Uh, and all forms of technology evolve according to the, the need you are trying to, set, to satisfy. And if in, in this particular case we're talking about language, uh, and basically, uh, if we go along, the, going along the line that uh, uh, Dr. Kumala was uh, talking about, you're actually translating from one form of language to another. Mm -hmm. Basically, that is what you're doing. Because th the way it is, that, th that is possible because language, the spoken language, or any other f form, form of language, including even signing, 
uh, is rule governed. And the programming you are going to do there when you develop uh, your, 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 your software is also language. It's programming language and uh, it's also rules. Although, of course, you're using other things. You'll we'll start talking about algorithms and so on, which we, some of us know nothing about. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but what I can do if I am in a team with that guy is I will be able to explain to him the rules uh, of how the language works and all the little elements and the patterns that are possible to the minutest detail. All right? And he will be able to translate that into the kind of the language uh, that is coding for, 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 for IT. Mm -hmm. right? And the, uh, the intervention is what give us, gives us at the end the tools mm -hmm. because it's actually processing and we're talking here of natural language processing and you get artificial intelligence coming in mm -hmm. and uh, you end up perhaps with a digital translator mm -hmm. which is what you, you are saying you need mm -hmm. uh, that will because people want things quickly now they want results they want to do this and and get the answer and with digital technology with that kind of uh, specialist input from all those directions, you, you'll get one in the end. Mm -hmm. But you, at the beginning, you start with very simple things. You know, your corpus best dictionary, mm -hmm. all right, which is actually drawing from real language. Mm -hmm. And the dictionary, as you know, is the meeting point of all the disciplines. They start, when you st want to start to understand anything, you go to the general dictionary before you even go to the more specialized ones. Then, uh, well, depending on your field, you'll find there are all kinds of dictionaries in all kinds of, of fields. Those are other levels, but the principle is basically the same. Even uh, this, um, well, uh, you know, if, 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 you, if you, right now, if, uh, if, you, if, if you go into, if you're looking up something in Wikipedia or what, that's a, that's a, a, a dictionary of an elaborate form, it's an encyclopedic type dictionary. Mm -hmm. And th th this is what we're talking about. But uh, I am saying we have or should be breaking from our old silos where as linguists we are in our corner mm -hmm. and we're just concerned about how language works and uh, the somebody else is doing something else and so on because we are, our specialist uh, knowledge and, and, and research and the results is supposed to help people. Mm -hmm. Is, 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 is for, so we uh, should be concerned at some point coming from all those mm -hmm. areas at what this is serving and it should be interesting mm -hmm. and one of the uh, difficulties is um, there is this perception that oh well uh, local languages or African languages don't have the capacity to do one two or three mm -hmm. things you know it, that capacity is developed it's, it's a process but mm -hmm. the, uh, the, 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 the the design of the tool itself leaves all of that open mm -hmm. right so but but te technology and that we do have to round up the, yeah. the, the conversation it, the, the question still remains while a computer program may enable um, conversational um, language may enable me to understand whether you have a stomach ache um, does it enable the theorization around that stomach ache, the, 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 the kinds of scientific and um, academic um, language? Because the way I speak conversational English with my grandmother would be different from the way I would write an academic paper. And so if I'm wanting to write an, a paper in an academic, in a language that is not my own, and then to take that further step into an into making it an academic language. There, there's, there's various steps in, involved there. And I'm wondering about technology, the role of technology even in that. Because surely somebody can create that too. Or do you think that's too far-fetched? It's only at this basic level. Uh, well, we'll get there. But we are writing a lot of, uh, is, once you have uh, initiated this kind of uh, uh, process of digitizing humanities, bringing in other, engineer, uh, other sub, uh, subject areas like engineering and computer science, uh, you begin to uh, locate interesting academic uh, trajectories that you, that you write papers uh, uh, about. Uh, incidentally, last year I, I published 
three papers with a computer engineer, uh, Dr. My, uh, Dr. Maria Kitt at uh, U University of uh, Cape Town on controlled natural languages in Isizulu. So you are embodying this disruptive innovation, actually. Indeed. Through this transdisciplinary way of working. So that, that language provides an opportunity, actually, Indeed. to work in a transdisciplinary um, way. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And we are actually in the process of publishing in Language Resources and Evaluation another a third installment of, of how you can uh, develop controlled natural languages computationally using a language that we, we speak every day and we don't think that deeply about. Uh, so uh, we are trying to bring to the fore uh, the collaboration between uh, quintessential humanist and uh, the so-called scientist mm -hmm. and to show that uh, you find science in language. Yes. And we can publish in the traditional uh, language journals what we think uh, uh, can be presented as uh, science, as, as novelty. That is based on this. And, um, and this is why I am very passionate about seeing how uh, we can uh, break from our silos and locate each other in our different specialities. And in that sense, bring uh, language to the, the digital world that it is. And I think Professor Chimundu uh, on Wednesday is going to uh, locate that rightly at the center of our, our academy today, that ICTs can uh, find expression uh, even in, 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 in uh, language and uh, analyzing language and how language can be used as a vehicle for, for, for developing these uh, human language technologies. I think this is a fascinating discussion and one that we can engage in all day. But unfortunately, our time has come to an yeah. end. I'm going to ask our panelists to briefly say something, just for 30 seconds, parting shots about the road ahead. Just to summarize, I will say it is the responsibility uh, of everyone to contribute to uh, language um, language raising, but the academy, the university, being at the apex of the uh, education system as an important, uh, uh, the most important responsibility to realize that these kinds of uh, cross-cutting, cross-disciplinary collaborations are essential uh, to start with. And then from whatever work is going on, there has to be a link with the community through a process of engagement and also through the education system scaling down. Mm -hmm. Even to the level where you start with all these complex tools, products and so on, and you come down to preschool and you present the same things in a simplified way as just games. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. I think in South Africa we have excellent policy in place. Right from the constitution downwards, language has been foregrounded as mm -hmm. being extremely important. And so I think the next step is to actually bring that policy into practice. And I think these opportunities for curriculum reform across the universities, an excellent opportunity for raising language as part of the curricular reform. I think uh, language intellectualization is something that is uh, doable, something that, is, uh, that we need to accelerate in order to uh, transform these languages from what we could call vernaculars, village languages, languages with narrow usage, uh, to be at the center of language uh, uh, knowledge development and to be at the center of the knowledge economy as we know it today, so that we can uh, then bring to the fore the communities that have been s objects of our research to be subjects of the academy. Wonderful. So thank you very much to all our panelists. The central question of this um, conference is, can policy learn from practice? And certainly the, the wonderful innovative work that our scholars are working on um, at the moment certainly suggests that uh, policy can learn from practice. So thank you very much for your time and we thank look forward so to further engagement at the conference. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you both.